good to see you all here. We got we got visitors. You're not you're not visitors anymore. You're you're honored guests now. Okay, we just love y'all. We just want you to to uh, come back and, and worship with us all the time. So West Freeway Church of Christ Wednesday evening worship service and Bible study. And so uh, want you guys to hang out and meet everybody. And uh, let's let's sing praises to the Lord. <clears throat> Deep cleansing breath. I know that my Redeemer lives and ever prays for me. I know eternal life He gives from sin and sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer. Humble yourself inside of the Lord. Humble yourself inside of the Lord. And He will lift you up. And He will lift you up. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God, and He, He died for us, and He, He died for us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, that saved a wretch like me. When we've been there 10,000 
thousand years when we've been there ten thousand years bright shining as the sun bright shining as the sun so humble yourself inside of the Lord so humble yourself inside of the Lord and he devotional and our prayer and then we'll have our classes. All right, if you want to go ahead and open your Bibles, we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 3 beginning in verse 17. And to kind of introduce this idea, have you ever tried to put together a puzzle but you didn't have the box? No, right, because that's hard. It's almost impossible to try to put a puzzle together if you don't have an idea of what the final product is supposed to look like. It, it, it can be done, kind of, but you, if you can't really see how all of the pieces are supposed to fit together, it can be really hard to, to get something that looks like it's supposed to at the end. And this is true in all aspects of life. Right? We as human beings learn better when we have a concrete example of what we are supposed to be doing. Right? Whether you're trying to learn a new piece of music. Right? When I was in music school, learning a passage of music, a lot of times it was helpful to have my private lesson teacher play it for me. And then I could see, oh, that, that's how that's supposed to flow. That's how that makes sense. Uh, if we're trying to learn a new skill on the job site or for our career, watching somebody do it first is usually the first step into being able to do it better ourselves. And so it's also important when we are learning these new things and we are learning by example that we are following the right example. Uh, a lot of people have fallen prey to poor information and inaccurate Examples. They learn how to do something, but they don't learn how to do it the right way. So we have to discern what a correct example is so that we can learn accordingly. And in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 17, Paul calls on us as Christian believers to find other faithful Christians to be our example. So look with me in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 17. It says, Brethren, Join in following my example, and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk with whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. All right, so Paul begins this section of scripture by imploring the Philippians to follow his example. Notice he says, look to me as an example and follow after me. And really his desire here is not for the things of the world, but of Christ. He's not trying to gain followers for himself. He wants them to push aside all of the things that they might be proud of in this life so that they can focus on Jesus. In Philippians chapter 3, the first 14 verses of this chapter, Paul talked about all of the reasons that he had to boast in the flesh, that he was a Jew of the Jews, that he was a Pharisee. He understood the law. He had lived under the law his whole life. And he talked about all of these reasons he had in the flesh physically to be proud of, and he said, you know what, I count all of that as loss for Jesus. None of that mattered. The only thing that mattered to Paul was that he continued striving to please God. And so Paul encouraged the Philippians to seek other people who were doing the same thing and to take note of those who were walking 
well. To examine the lives of Christians who were doing the Christian thing the right way. And to follow after them. And so Paul commands us to find people who are faithful. To examine their lives and to follow them in as much as they follow Christ. And he says in 1 Corinthians 4, 16, Therefore I urge you, imitate me. But he says in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Find people who are really reflecting the personality and integrity and character of Jesus and see what they're doing and try to model your life after them. You know, the scriptures provide us a vast library of examples already that talk about faithful men and women who came before. Hebrews chapter 11 being a perfect example. It talks about the faith of Noah and Abraham and Moses and Rahab and the judges and the prophets. And we can read about their faithfulness. But, you know, it's, it's one thing to read about the faithfulness of people who lived thousands of years ago. And another thing to observe that faithfulness face to face. To be able to see what Christian living looks like in the modern age, in 2024, why don't we find someone who's living the Christian life in 2024 and start there? You know, Paul had already offered several examples. He talked about Jesus who was humble and selfless and offered himself to God even though he was God himself. He talked about Timothy whom he trusted to be able to go and minister to the Philippians. He talked about Epaphroditus who was a, a person who traveled to Paul to help him and was sick almost to the point of death, and yet he fulfilled his obligations to Paul. Each of these people lived spiritually focused lives where they loved others better than themselves. So let's find people in our congregations who are doing the right thing, who are living like Jesus, and let's develop relationship with those people. To find a closeness with people who are doing it right and let's use them as an example. Right? One of the beauties of Christianity is that God didn't create a system where it's just about my relationship with him and nobody else. God created a system where we have each other. Uh, where we have a family of believers together where we don't have to go about it alone. I can lean on my family. Right? That, that's what most of us do in times of crisis. If we have good relationships with our family, those are the people we go to first. Those are the people we lean on in times of trouble. Well, lean on each other, and that can also mean learning from each other. So let's find good examples and imitate those who are godly. But then Paul goes on and he talks about, uh, in verse 18, that there are some people who are not worthy of emulating. Paul admonishes the Philippians to know people who are not walking the way that they should and to try to avoid them. To not develop relationships with people who are going to encourage us to step farther away from Christ. In Romans chapter 16 and verse 17, Paul would say, I urge you, note those who cause divisions and offenses and, and, and avoid them. Now, we should never do this with a hateful attitude, but we should do it with hearts full of sorrow. That when we realize that there are brothers or sisters in our midst where being in a relationship with them might cause me to go farther from Christ, that should cause me sorrow. And, and, and we should try to, to get them back and to have positive interactions. We can't allow them to influence us. In 1 Corinthians 15.33, he says, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. We need to make sure that our influence the people who influence us the most are people who are the most like Jesus Christ. But finally, we have to look forward to the goal. The, the reason that we should strive to imitate godly people is because the destination of godly people is a place worth going to. He talks about our citizenship that is in heaven and that we are waiting for Jesus Christ who is going to transform our earthly bodies into something that is beyond into these spiritual bodies that are fit for heaven. Brethren, we have the assurance of being resurrected into a perfect body to be with Jesus Christ forever. We 
do that by living a faithful life. Now, it should sadden us when people rebel against Jesus and they rob themselves of these immense blessings. Notice, Paul says, I tell you, even weeping, that there are some who are enemies of Christ. He weeps because he knows that they're giving up. But that should be a source of strength for us. To know that when we imitate the godly and follow in their footsteps, we are following on a path towards heaven. A path that is pleasing to God. And so I would encourage all of us, let's keep working on developing relationships that we have with one another. You know, this Saturday we have an, a great opportunity to do that with our, our family game night. All right, come bring, bring a friend. Bring food, bring games. We're going to have a good time. But that's a really great place to start developing these relationships and finding people who are living the right way that you can become close to and that you can imitate. Don't go through life trying to put the puzzle together without the box. Right? Let's find other people, imitate them, and together we can be a more pleasing congregation for the Lord. The lesson is yours. Let's... Uh, Go ahead and have a word of prayer, and then we'll dismiss. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the opportunity that we have to be here together tonight. And Father, we're grateful for the bond and the relationship that we can share uh, because of our shared faith in Jesus. Father, pray that as we go throughout the, the remainder of our time here in our classes, uh, that we would have our minds open to the things that are being said, that we would be able to, to learn more and, and increase our devotion to you, but also that we might make a commitment to increasing our devotion to one another, to loving each other more and becoming more of the family that you would have us to be. Lord, be with us as we leave here and go to our classes. Pray that all things that are done and said tonight would be in accordance with your will. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, y'all are dismissed to your classes. Uh, it, it is shameful. You know, when, when Ronnie asked me, I told, he's like, you know, like a five-minute Devo. And I said, I can do a five-minute Devo in 15 minutes. Easy. No problem. All right, so we are in chapter two of First Thessalonians tonight. And just to kind of review a little bit of what we did last time, uh, we finished up with chapter one, and we kind of noted Paul's purpose, right? Why, why is he writing this book? To support the good already being done by the Thessalonians. He had commended them for the good work that they were already doing. And he really wanted that to continue. He knew that there was going to be some challenges they were facing. Challenges they had already faced. Wanted to encourage them to keep doing the right thing. Um, and then to strengthen the relationship that Paul had with the Thessalonians and himself. Right? If we look back into Acts chapter 17... Uh, Paul only had a few weeks to develop that initial relationship with the Thessalonians. He wanted to make sure that relationship was going to stay strong, and so he writes this letter to encourage them. And then finally, he, he talks about some things that he, uh, in, in chapter 1, that he's going to develop throughout the rest of the book. And one of those things uh, was about the character and conduct of Paul 
and his companions when they were there in Thessalonica the first time. And that is going to be Paul's focus here in chapter 2, is the conduct of the messengers. And so I I have this this section. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 12. And I have this titled, Faithful Messengers. And this is all about what faithful messengers do. And Paul is using this as a way to remind them that the message that they received is good and pure and it is true. So let's go ahead and get into it. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we'd suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we had been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness, God is witness. Nor do we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For remember, brethren, our labor and toil, for laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses in God also how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory." All right, so as Paul is describing his conduct, let's, the, the conduct of faithful messengers, let's see what we can learn. Number one, this first section, is that faithful member, messengers handle the message carefully. Right? Notice he says here, You know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. The word vain refers to any activity that is without profit or without effect. If something it is vain, it is empty, it is worthless, it is useless. Useless. Man, my tongue is just not wanting to cooperate with me tonight. That's all right. So, if Paul had brought them a message that was fake, right? If he had brought a message that was just designed to deceive people into following him, would that message have had any power or benefit to them? Not at all. And so when he says this, our our message that we brought to you, it wasn't this empty, ineffective, useless message. It actually had power. And now he says at the beginning of this verse, you know, you know, brethren, that our coming to you is not in vain. How was it evident to Paul and to the Thessalonians that his message had power? It it came from God. What was the evidence that this had power for the Thessalonians? Yes, sir. It affected so many of them in such a positive way. It showed them. Because this town was so cosmopolitan, it took something really extraordinary to pull them away from that former life to understand the working of God and how it will work in their lives. That's absolutely right. The fact that they, these Thessalonian, Thessalonian brethren who lived in this, this very pagan, cosmopolitan area had been pulled away from that culture to believe in Jesus showed that this message had power. They had already been wholeheartedly converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so this was a testimony already of the power of the message that Paul brought. Uh, we read about their conversion that he commends them for in 1 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 10. And then, of course, Paul would say in Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Right, so this power of salvation and, and conversion, right? Power to me is the opposite of being vain or ineffective or useless. God's message had power. It was effective. And the reason it was effective is because Paul didn't bring a personal message. He brought the message of God himself. 
And he did so even under the threat of persecution. Right? And we've rehearsed this several times in our previous classes, but you go all the way back. He talks about when we were spitefully treated at Philippi. Right? What, anybody can give me the short version of what happened to Paul in Philippi. Yeah, jail. There's, there's the short one-word answer, right? Paul was thrown in jail. He, he healed a, a woman who had a, a demon. The, a, the master of this slave, they, they were uh, pretty miffed at Paul because that kind of got rid of a, a source of income for them, and they got everybody to go against them. They were thrown in prison for no fault of their own, right? They did a good thing, and they ended up having to suffer for it. But they preached the gospel to that Philippian jailer, didn't they? Right? Even in suffering, they continued to teach. And that persecution that they had didn't stop in Philippi. Right? When they got into Thessalonica, there was still persecution. Right? We talked about, uh, I believe it was the house of, of well, I'm going to have to look now or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it wrong. The leader of the synagogue. Right? Who had harbored them. They came out. Gaius. Gaius. Okay, they came out, they beat him up because they were harboring these Christians. And once again, they turned the city against them. They saw persecution firsthand. They saw how people uh, rejected fiercely the message of Christ. And so the question is why would Paul and Silas subject themselves to such persecution? if they didn't believe the message. Right? Are, are you going to suffer for a cause that you don't really believe in? No. But are you willing to put up with a lot of grief if you are really passionate about that cause? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Right? If they were to suffer for something that they didn't really believe and that wasn't that important to them, that just flies in the face of reason. However, because they were convinced that their message was truth, they were willing to confidently preach the gospel, even though it was counter to the culture, they were willing to preach the gospel because they believed it had power. Now, just because someone is willing to suffer for something doesn't automatically make it true. Right? We understand that. But nobody suffers for something when they aren't convinced that it's right. Okay? These messengers were convinced fully convinced of the message that they were bringing. And so this faithfulness in the face of adversity is one of the proof of their pure motives. Paul suffered for the gospel because he believed in its power, and so should we. God said in Isaiah 55, verse 11, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper for the thing in which I sent it. They were, they were convinced that the message had power, and it did. And so they saw that they were spitefully treated at Philippi. They continued to speak the gospel of God in much conflict. Right? didn't matter that there was persecution. They continued to teach because they were convicted of the message. And then he says, For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. Hey, when they came and they taught to the Thessalonians, they taught the gospel plainly. They didn't want the Thessalonians to think of them as just a, another group of teachers who were trying to make a living by their wit, by peddling their wisdom in the marketplace. They needed to understand that this message was pure. He starts by saying, number one, our warnings, our message, it didn't come from error. In other words... Paul's message was the gospel of Christ. It wasn't the result of faulty reasoning. It wasn't the result of human wisdom. Anytime we are speaking just from human wisdom, there is the, there's the chance the speaker has made a logical error and that all of his conclusions are wrong. Not going to be so with the gospel. There is no error in the things in which he spoke. Yes, sir. Groups separating themselves 
that were following a false doctrine of Christ. It's possible that there was false doctrine happening. You know, I, I think also Paul is just trying to make a contrast between those human teachers who would have been you know, trying to get people to follow after them. Whatever the case, whether this is coming from people who are bringing those ideas and kind of blending them with Christianity and creating a false doctrine, or he's just comparing himself to the secular teachers, the point is that what we brought was different. Our motives behind our teaching were plain. We weren't teaching error. There was no uncleanness, and that's the idea of impure motives. It wasn't personal. And there was no deceit. Paul wasn't trying to hide anything about the gospel message, right? Paul wasn't trying to use this bait and switch tactic to, to bring them in and hide the truth from them and then tell them, oh, okay, well, here's all of the other stuff that you have to know about the gospel. No, he told them plainly what they needed to know. Now, I'll ask you this. Are there bad arguments that support truth? Yes. Yes, okay. They are absolutely bad arguments that can support something that is true, right? The conclusion might be right, but the logic that gets you there is all kinds of wrong. Now, how might a person's faith be affected if they are convinced by a bad argument to follow Jesus. Man, think about somebody who may be convinced by a, an argument with logical flaws and errors. When somebody, when somebody contradicts that belief or that argument, and then they realize it was full of logical errors, what is it going to do to the faith of that person? Yeah, I mean, more than likely it's going to be shattered, at least diminished and going to cause them to doubt and to question. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. But if someone is out here lazy and everything, instead of quoting that, people would say, a dove should set on its own bottom. Like they're quoting scripture. Yeah, there, there, are, there are a lot of things that we kind of tout as truth, these ideas that aren't actually found in scripture, right? Okay. You know. Right, right. And so the, the point is, is that just because an argument supports your claim doesn't mean that it's logically sound, okay? So we need to make sure when we're teaching others that we're just not presenting them with the quick and dirty argument just to try to get them onto our side. That is not the point, right? When, when Paul was teaching, and remember in Acts chapter 17, it, it used the words that Paul reasoned, Paul demonstrated, and Paul explained from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. He, he did this for those three Sabbath days that he was there. He presented these arguments, good arguments, from the Scriptures. And so, we need to be diligent to present ourselves approved to God, worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Right? Paul didn't add any type of error or uncleanness or deceit. There wasn't any impure motives. He simply took the gospel, took the message... And he presented to it, to these people, as clearly as he possibly could. Right? That's what a faithful messenger does. And secondly, a faithful messenger teaches with godly motives. Right? As we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak. Okay? When, when we are having a Bible study with somebody, we are having even just a religious conversation with somebody, we have to remember that we are speaking on behalf of God. We are not sharing an opinion. We are sharing, or we should be sharing, simply, this is what God says. It's not my message, right? So we have to treat it with the care and respect it deserves, because it's a divine message. But then Paul says, I speak this message from God, not my own, not to please men, but to please God who tests our hearts. Right? With people, sometimes it can be difficult to detect impure motives. 
right? We, we can't always tell exactly what a person wants. They can be difficult to spot. But can we hide our intentions from God? No. Why, why not? How, why can't we hide what, what our real motives are from God? God knows it. God knows our hearts. He talks about in 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7, the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Right? God can see beyond the front that we might put up into who we actually are. And so Paul was obligated to speak not to please men who were only going to see the outside. Paul's obligation to speak was for a God that was going to judge his intentions, not just his actions, but the intent behind those actions as well. And so it would be pretty foolish of him to change God's message in order to please the messengers. That, that's, that's not how that works. If we change the message simply to come across as more desirable when we're having a religious conversation or a Bible study, we're not really doing that other person any favors. We, we, are, we are robbing the gospel of its power. And Paul talks in Galatians 1, 6 through 10, if we or an angel from heaven speak to you any other gospel than what you've heard, let him be accursed. He right? says if, if a, a divine being comes and teaches you something that's different than what was confirmed to you the first time, don't have anything to do with them. Let them be set apart for destruction by God. And so if we try to change the message, we're not doing them any favors. We're, we're presenting them to a message that will ultimately lead to destruction. Well, that's emphasizing the simplicity of the message that's being presented. Pure and simple, no mental gymnastics required to understand what you need to do to please God. Right. A lot of the mental gymnastics come from having to undo misunderstandings about the gospel. Right? The, the, the gospel itself is actually pretty simple. And that's part of Paul's point here, is that when they were presenting the gospel message, they didn't have to add anything to it. They weren't using any of these uh, underhanded tactics to get people on their side. They simply presented the message and let people make their own decisions. Notice what he says. He says, we didn't use flattering words, nor a cloak for covetousness. And he says, you know and God is a witness. Right? So they were fully aware of how Paul was acting. Then he also says, God is going to vouch for me too. God knows my intentions. And if you understand Paul's relationship with God, you know it's pretty serious if he is invoking God as a witness for what he's saying. Then he says, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. The point that he is trying to make is that when they brought the gospel to them, it was not at all for personal gain. Right? So going back to this idea of flattering words, right? What what is flattery? Flattery, flattery. Flowery? Okay, what what's what's the purpose of flattery? Yeah, you make the other piece and fear good. Yeah, you're making someone feel better on, on your account, right? You, you're, you're trying to butter them up, maybe, is one way that we might say it. Polite deceit. Yes, okay, I love that definition, polite deceit. Sometimes flattery, there may be like the tiniest kernel of truth, and then we way exaggerate it, right? We, we are trying to tell people less of what is true, and we're more trying to tell people what we think they want to hear. That is flattery. And that's exactly the idea that Paul is getting across with this idea of flattering words. He was not trying to fit the truth into popular opinion to make it more palatable. Right? We weren't trying to use flattering words. We weren't telling you what you wanted to hear. A lot of philosophers and a lot of religious teachers at that time were trying to speak a message that was pleasing because they needed followers. They needed patrons. This is how they were going to get their money. For many teachers, sharing that wisdom was a means to an end or, like Paul says, a cloak for covetousness. They weren't sharing this wisdom out of altruism and a deep desire for the betterment of humankind. Okay? 
Ultimately, it was self-serving, but not for Paul. We didn't try to flatter you. We weren't trying to use this as a means to gain. Because he brings up in verse 6, we didn't seek glory from men, from you or others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. Right? Paul, as an apostle, had a significant amount of religious authority. He could have demanded their respect. He could have demanded, and rightfully demanded, financial support so that he could continue what he was doing. He could have asserted his rights as an apostle, but he chose not to because he didn't want to be lumped in with all of the other teachers who were just trying to get more for themselves. John, you had a comment. And that would be lacking the love of God in the first place by doing that. Absolutely. Right? There would have been a lack of love. Paul wasn't about abusing his authority and his ability to make life easier for him. Right? Doing so would have come at the cost of undermining the gospel message he preached. And so he didn't do it, right? Paul kept the ultimate goal in mind, which is uh, we are trying to convert and to save and to encourage these people here in Thessalonica so that they can belong to God. And so we, too, when we are having a religious discussion, we have to keep the goal in mind, which is to save souls. Okay? Many religious arguments have been had not because you really care about the other person, but because somebody wanted to be right. In that situation, if you're just arguing because you want to be right, who are you actually trying to please? Yourself. Yourself right? You're not trying to please God. You know, sometimes people might want to just show off how much they know and they get into a religious debate. And really all that does is show their ignorance of what God actually wants. Right? The goal of gospel teaching in any and every context should always be to please God and to help others to please Him also. Right? If selfish motivations ever enter the equation, we're going to be held accountable. Right? It's going to come on us for tainting the message. And we need to, again, faithful messengers handle the message carefully. Right? We need to treat it as divine and not interject any of our feelings, or things that we want out of it, right? This is the essence of agape love, is that we are always looking at how can the other person benefit? How can I bring this other person to a place in life that is better for them? And ultimately, that's going to be bringing them to Christ. But then faithful messengers love the people that they teach. It says here, we were gentle among you just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. Uh, the word gentle here can just be translated as kind. And I think this is especially important in contrast to verse 6 where he said, look, we could have made demands of you. Right? Once you believed, we could have start, started making demands because we were, the, you know, in some ways, in a human sense, the highest religious authority that was there, but we didn't. We were kind and gentle to you just as a nursing mother nourishes her own children. All right. You mothers, how, how did you feel about your infant children? Just kind of, eh? eh? Yeah, no. I mean, there is, there is so much documented evidence that shows that really the brain chemistry of a woman changes when she has a child. You know, the, the amount of selfless love that you feel towards that child is like, is like nothing that can really be described. Right? And I know I love Brenna, but I still know that it's getting to that understanding of being a nursing mother is something I'm never going to fully appreciate. And yet Paul says, this is how we treated you. We cherished you. We wanted the best for you. And we were tender, right? You know, when you're with the nursing infant, you put up with all of, of the crying and screaming and all of that nonsense because you love that child and you are gentle with them. Right? You don't yell at the baby because they're crying. They don't know any better. Paul says, look, I, when we were here, we weren't just bashing you over the head because you weren't automatically living the right wife. We were, we were tender. You know, most mothers would protect their children with the fury of a thousand sons. 
That's how Paul felt about the Thessalonians. He wanted to be tender to them. He wanted to protect them and give them what they needed. And that's how we should feel about people that we are trying to reach with the gospel. Whether that's in a Bible study or like here teaching a Bible class or a family devotional. The baseline attitude should always be one of love. That I am doing this for the other person. Right? Ephesians 4.15 talks about speaking the truth in love. Right? That we speak the truth is non-negotiable, but how we speak the truth is equally as important. Right? It's very easy to speak the truth in, in anger or in indignation. Right? Again, this idea of just, I'm just trying to win an argument. We speak the truth in love. There is a purpose behind it. Paul talks about 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. The, the kind of shortened version is, hey, I could tell you all the truth in the world, but if I'm not doing it in love, it's pointless. If I'm not teaching in love, it profits nothing. Love is the foundation that we do for everything in Christianity. Right? God loved the world and sent his son. That's the foundation of, of our salvation is God's love for us. So our foundation for every interaction we have with other people should be love. That includes when we are teaching God's word to others. Okay? And then another way that we love the people that we teach is that we give to them. It says, look, we didn't just impart, or this, this idea is to share. Right? We didn't just share the gospel with you. We shared our lives with you. They went above and beyond simply teaching them what they needed to know and they gave them their own lives. This indicates this close personal involvement that he had with those people. To me, this giving of yourself indicates a sacrifice of time and energy. And the Thessalonians already knew firsthand that Paul had suffered on their behalf. But then he goes on and says, we shared our lives with you. And we also, uh, verse 9, remember our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Here, this is specifically referring to a a financial burden. right? He told them, hey, when we were here in Thessalonica, instead of demanding financial support from you like so many others would have done, we're going to make sure the gospel isn't hindered. And we worked. We worked to provide for ourselves so that we could fully focus on giving you what you needed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, it says, Whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, or who tends a flock and does not drink the milk of the flock, Do I say these things as a mere man, or does not it say in the law also? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. The point he's making in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is that a a preacher of the gospel has every right to be paid for the services that he he renders. The time spent in preparation, in in being with the people, in teaching, he could be compensated for that. And yet, Paul in this instance looked at the surroundings that he was in. Right? In the cultural context of Thessalonica, and decided, you know what? I can give up this right because it's going to be better for the people. He was doing so much and willing to work so much harder and suffer to try to avoid any association with the religious con men that would have been rampant in Thessalonica. It was exhausting work, but he did it because he loved the brethren. You know, we brought up 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. I'm reminded of Jesus from Mark chapter 6, 30 and 34. Essentially, he had been working all day long. He had not even had a chance to sit down and eat. And then the people come to him wanting to be taught. And you know what he does? He, he teaches. He had compassion on the people because the needs of others are more important than his needs. Right? And I think that's exactly the type of attitude that Paul is reflecting here. And so, how can we apply that to sharing the gospel with others? Yeah. 
Yeah. If we, if we are willing to make the sacrifice of time to be there to teach, that's going to make a big impact, I think. If we're willing to show that we're, we're willing to make a sacrifice of our money, because yeah, that's really what Paul was doing here, right? if we're willing to make a sacrifice of, of our money at times, it's going to have a big impact. We have to be willing to share of ourselves. Right? And so uh, this applies especially to, to reaching out to the lost, but even more so to us as children of God. We have to be in the habit of sharing our lives with one another. That's what's going to increase our ability to work and be more effective in our community. Yes, sir. No. <laughs> that's, the, that's the answer you're going to get 99 times out of 10 if you just come out of the blue and say, do you want to study the gospel? But if you develop a relationship with a person first and they understand that there is, there is a genuine care for them, they're much more likely to say yes. And they may even start asking questions beforehand where you can lead into this idea of a Bible study, right? So they, they shared their lives with them, so they understood, hey, it's not about us. It's about our relationship with you, okay? And then finally, faithful messengers practice what they preach. As you are witnesses in God, also how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe, as you know how we exhorted, comforted, and charged every one of you as a father to his own children that you shall walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Right? Our character should be obvious to other people. Right? He says, you are witnesses and God also. God calls the Thessalonians and God himself to be a witness of their conduct because Paul's conduct would have been so obvious to the Thessalonians that Paul was doing it because of his relationship with God and no other reason. <laughs> And so, like, it, it should be very clear to other people in our life who know us where our priorities are. I remember um, at Burleson High School, they, they do an event called See You at the Pole, which is essentially a, a prayer meeting that happens before school. And I remember we had a few guys in Drumline that were, were not at morning practice because they went to see you at the pole. And I was like, no way. Christians, and then they, they talked to me, and they told me about the, the congregations that they went to, and I was like, I was surprised. Don't let that happen to you. The way you do that is where, where you are, are genuine about who you are, and you, you focus on doing the right thing first, right? He says, we were devout and just and blameless. If, if Paul and the others had not acted in a godly manner while they were there in Thessalonica, what, what might have happened to the power of the message? The power of the message can be lost if the messengers aren't living up to that message. All right? uh, in Romans 2, 23 and 24, it says, You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now, in context, in Romans 2, Paul is talking about the Jews, but the principle applies, is that if we aren't doing the things that God requires and we are living in conflict with God's message, all we're doing is giving other people a reason to reject God's message. Okay, but they didn't. They were living in harmony. And so I think what was happening is more what Jesus describes in Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Right? If people can glorify God through our good works... The opposite is also true. Right? So we have to be consistent 
with the message. That if we are telling people that this is true, this is right, this is how you should live, brethren, we better be living that way. And they should be able to see that in our actions. And then finally, we need to be an example of godliness. Paul reminds the Thessalonians that he exhorted them as a father to walk worthy of God. Right Now, this is the second kind of reference to family that Paul has made. First, he said, we, were, we treated you like a nursing mother, right? talking about that nurture and tenderness and care. Then he also said, we treated you as a father, right? and that we were trying to guide and to discipline. Right? Those are kind of those, those two ideas of mother and father. He said, we did both. We were trying to prepare you to walk worthy of God. Paul was not saying, do what I say, not as I do, right? Paul was saying to them, imitate me. We're teaching you all those things because we want you to walk worthy of God so that you can be part of that kingdom that they were teaching them about, right? So if we are going to be effective and faithful messengers of the gospel, we have to practice what we preach. Questions or comments before we close for tonight? All right, very good. Let's go to our Father in prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity that we've had to be here tonight and to look into your word. And, uh, Father, we are grateful for, for Paul and Silas and Timothy and the, the work that they did in Thessalonica and the example that they were to our brethren those many, many years ago. And Father, pray that we might strive to develop character like theirs, uh, to be faithful messengers of the gospel in every way, to, to have a good character, to, to be careful uh, with the message and to, to make it a part of our lives and to know it properly so that we can share it with those who are in the world. And Father, pray that you would help us to share our lives with others, to really show other people the love of Christ and that we might not just limit that to our own families or to people that we're trying to teach, but that we might share that relationship with one another as your children in the church. Father, pray that you would be with us here as we leave tonight and go to our separate homes. Pray that you would watch over us and keep us safe. And if it be your will, bring us together once again. Sings we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, y'all are dismissed.